Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you uh, Saturday morning. It's got a lot going on uh, this weekend. Uh, I am the uh, guest speaker on the Sunrise uh, Project podcast tomorrow morning talking about uh, black men and mental health. Uh, the Sunrise Project, I've been a, a guest expert there for going on, what, I guess three years now. We got picked up by uh, the OWN Network's podcast division, and we're still going strong. Um, as soon as I get the link information and everything, uh, which I'm pretty sure is in my inbox somewhere, I will get it to you. Uh, before I get started with this heart to heart, uh, I want to encourage you uh, to support the work we do. Um, I do this often. Uh, it was something that I had to really be proud of to do uh, a few years back. And uh, when I think about the people who do believe in me and the frustration they experience because um, we're underfunded, uh, and they're saying ask and they're telling me to put my pride aside and uh, ask even if they don't give ask and so I've just started doing it and now uh, it is what it is but uh, the work we do in the community is so necessary if you don't know what we do there's a link in the description box to the organization's website where there is a catalog of programs we offer, uh, uh, a year-by-year -year assessment of the last 10 years of what we've been doing. Um, and we've actually been doing it a lot longer than that, but I know the site goes back at least 10, 12 years. Uh, we've been going, I think it's like almost close to a thousand articles alone on the site that I've written. I mean, on that one site, um, there's the blueprint to black empowerment on that site, the code the, uh, of conduct for the black community on that site. There is a breakdown of programs like Black Man Lead, and uh, our program still trying to decide what we're going to do with the program uh, as far as whether we're going to keep the name uh, that we've always had as far as our program for black women. Uh, obviously, you know, there were some changes that went on, and uh, I'm not going to get into that, but uh, I want to be respectful of that. So uh, I'm going to, in the next week or so, kind of get a better understanding of how we're going to move with that. Uh, I'm hoping we keep it the same because I really believe in it. Uh, but it's not just me. But the work we do uh, will still continue. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about a branding issue more than anything, but it will continue. We're going to do the work we've always done with black women, uh, domestic violence, uh, childhood sexual abuse, uh, and so much more. Uh, mental health programs, wraparound services for uh, our young adults to ensure they're prepared to compete in this world so much more, not to mention um, all of the research uh, that is conducted um, through the organization's research center so that we can develop um, programs uh, and strategies and ideas and have critical uh, discussions uh, about uh, probable solutions uh, to the enigmatic issues we face consistently and constantly in this country. Uh, support the work we do. Um, throughout the weekend, uh, anyone who donates uh, a minimum of $100 will receive my 19th book, which is Born in Captivity. Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. I think that book, as much as any of the others, points to uh, the need for so much work to be done on us. And only we uh, can make that happen. No one's going to fund our empowerment. So whenever you see big government entities and 
uh, corporate entities and big sponsorships getting behind something, trust and believe they've already researched and understood that while it's good for the optics, it has no real true meaning. You want to see some things that work, watch the underfunded, boots on the ground, grassroots efforts uh, across this country. Not just what we do at the Odyssey Project, but there's so many things going on underfunded that really work. And you know they work because you don't get... Uh, anytime you see the enemy or the opposition heavily invested in something, you have to know that it's not for your benefit. It's it's simple. It, that is, is probably one of the most simple forms of deductive reasoning that you can come through. Hey, the person who uh, benefits from uh, my struggles is investing heavily in this, then you have to think that at the very minimum, it's an illusion. It's a distraction. Um, it's sleight of hand. But it's our responsibility to be aware and to do for self. So again, I am going to ask you to support the work we do uh, in the community. Um, in one way or another, I've always been extremely proud of my blackness. Um, this thing isn't new for me and I can't really truly explain it in detail, uh, how it's entrenched in me uh, from such an early age. But I knew long before I left middle school that I was gonna make my life stand for something. I had a, <clears throat> determined that I was either going to be an attorney and help my people or I was going to venture into the realm of psychology to understand why we are where we are and why we behave a certain way because I had learned and believed at that early age that all behavior is explainable, that it is explicable that you can look and study and gain an understanding of why people do things barring major mental psychosis which then becomes the explanation there are reasons that people behave the way they behave it doesn't offer a justification for non uh, social or counterproductive or intrusive behavior but it explains it in a manner that gives us an idea of what we must do to mitigate the behavior that doesn't serve us well. In other words, nothing is simply just happening. There's a cause for it. And I had at, 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 at that time determined which route I would take, but I knew it would be one of those two. It was just something that I had made up in my mind. And then in the 11th grade, 1985, I came home and um, the Phil Donahue show was on and on the Phil Donahue show there was this black uh, lady by the name of Dr. Francis Cress um, Welsing and she was defending her theory uh, of uh, color confrontation and she was doing it uh, in basically defending it against several white scholars or academicians. And this was on the heels of an argument of black inferiority based off of erroneous uh, data and studies surrounding the IQ test. And there was a big push in the late 70s, early 80s that uh, blacks were inherently intellectually inferior to whites. And it has since been debunked. I have actually published papers debunking it. Um, and yet they will still try to use it. I saw someone try to use it, what, this week? Um, but the truth of the matter is those who are well read, those who have done their research and are honest know that that's not the truth. The three highest IQs, as a matter of fact, in the world today are held by black youth. Uh, so um, 
they don't have that anymore. But at the time, it was a big thing. So to see a black woman in a white environment holding her own um, inspired me. And it was at that very moment that I made up in my mind that I was going to get into the realm of human behavior. Um, and I started my research and my reading. I started to try to understand. I went from Dr. Welsing to Neely Fuller Jr., from Neely Fuller Jr. to Dr. Naeem Agbar, from Dr. Naeem Agbar to Dr. Amos Wilson, and then from ch that to Chancellor Williams, and uh, just really starting to gain an understanding of what had happened. And then in the mid-'90s, uh, there was another argument um, that was rearing its head, and it, it had been around for decades, but it was gaining momentum, and it was the argument that it's been a hundred plus years, time to let it go, time to forget about it, time to move on. We're tired of hearing about slavery and trauma, and the argument was there's no such thing as multi-generational transmission of trauma. And I endeavored to, first of all, confirm the assumption. Uh, and I think later on down the line, uh, I think uh, Dr. Joy DeGruy did an immense job in post-traumatic slave syndrome in breaking it out. Uh, for lay people to understand. But when I started this, it started out as a study in what I called co uh, collective cognitive bias syndrome, uh, a universal type mindset created by way of trauma and experience uh, in the US as it pertains to the black collective. Now, as with any study or any type of social reality there are always exceptions uh there's no absolute in any group there's always going to be someone who doesn't it doesn't it apply to for whatever reason but collectively i saw a problem and so i decided to delve deeply into it and through that uh desire to understand uh that behavior and to also confirm that there is literal proof that multi-generational transmission of trauma is a reality. I began my research and I went back and I studied and I used it. Not only did I come across epigenetics, but I also discovered uh, the force of re-injury and traumatic experiences. Uh, we are talking about slavery as if as slavery, uh, when slavery ended, all of a sudden uh, we are now in, a, in 1865 in a space where all things are equal. There's no ambient hostility or direct hostility towards blacks, especially in the South. Uh, we're acting like there were states like Oregon that basically had codes uh, in the 30 lashes rule that if a black was caught in Portland for more than uh, uh, a freed slave was caught in Portland, I mean, not in Portland, in Oregon for more than 30 days, they would get 30 lashes. Uh, they didn't want uh, freed slaves there. Uh, and, you know, that idea that if I could just get to the North thing wasn't panning out well for most. And so they were trapped in the South in a hostile environment where they no longer had the protection of being valuable to plantation owners who would defend them, feed them, house them, but work them fingers to the bone. They were now not non valuable to these very same people who saw them as uh, a threat because they were the skilled workers, a threat because they came up with a great deal of the inventions that had brought along a technological advance in farming and industrialization. Uh, and so there were all these things that made that put a target on the back of blacks. In the south now 
So again, we didn't come out of 1865 landing in a utopia of opportunity. We came out of 1865 facing new challenges and new threats and still not having a place in a country that we played a major role in building. And so we have this thing going on and I'm moving through it and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. But one thing that my great grandfather, who was my adopted father, he took me and reared me, my grandfather, my grandmother's parents took me and reared me. And my grandfather would say, don't come complaining to me about anything that you haven't already tried to solve. Uh, he had to drop out of school in the second grade at seven years old in order to go out and help his father in the field. His father was a sharecropper. He was born in 1909. Uh, uh, my great-grandfather was, and my great-great-grandfather was a sharecropper. Uh, and so my, my, my great-grandfather had to go out in the field at seven years old and help just to make sure that the work was getting done and they were meeting the quota and staying ahead. And this was the story for many uh, sharecrop black sharecroppers uh, in the South. And the stories that I heard were nothing short of amazing to see that he had come out of that. But he will always tell me, don't complain about it find the solution and so while I'm looking at this I'm not looking at it for the sake of saying I have something now to, for which I can debate I have something now for which I can sit up and lard and talk about look what they've done I always approach my research with the under, with the with the with the purpose being I want to discover causality so that I can design a solution because when you understand cause you address the cause you address the cause you eliminate the problem we live in a world where we have a tendency to simply want to suppress symptoms and uh, we do that in our physiological health we do that in our emotional health we do that in our sociological ills we simply want to hide the symptoms we want the symptoms to go away and we will suppress the symptoms we will mask the symptoms we will distort the symptoms but we will not deal with causality we will not get to a point to where we are now searching out where it originates and that was my thing and so i read books like black skin white mask and wretched of the earth by franz fanon i i read uh slavery by another name and i did research after research peer-reviewed uh i can't tell you countless uh studies and uh research papers and dissertations and i i i, I i'm searching for this 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 particular nexus of connectivity that explains the black dilemma the black struggle the black hardship um and we are experiencing it in a spectrum of current and uh realities we are suffering socioeconomically we are suffering physiologically we are suffering in our mental health we are suffering in our relationships we are suffering in community development and community cohesiveness and strength we are suffering in family connectivity and longevity um that's the black family has all but disintegrated uh, and it is a mechanism of interest and uh, involvement by those who oppose us. It wasn't simply a happening of things. It was a systematic structural um, strategy. Um, and we had to participate. We had to, in some way, be compliant to a lot of the suggestions, a lot of the 
uh, mechanisms and machinations that were pushed upon us, we had to in some way be compliant. Racism becomes powerless when we stop being compliant, but we have been extremely compliant and it's that need to be accepted that is at the forefront of it because that dismissal of sorts or uh, that rejection of sorts doesn't feel well. No one wants to feel like they don't belong. So there's this fight. Why are you keeping me out? We needed to be accepted so badly that we sold off our wealth. We owned theaters. We owned cab companies. We we owned uh, our own shoe stores. We were we we had our own hospitals. Uh, growing up in Houston, my grandmother owned a beauty salon in the Fifth Ward area off of uh, those are from Houston, the off of Farm and Bringhurst. It was connected to Leroy's grocery store, a little grocery store owned by Leroy Brown. But um, if you come up and you rode down lounge, you would ride by uh, St. Elizabeth Hospital, a black owned hospital in the heart of the black community. And it wasn't the only one you rode down Homestead. There was a hospital on Homestead, a professional building with, with, with doctors in it. And eventually it just changed or it shut down. Why? We needed to be accepted. It was no longer okay for us to have our own enclaves. And and it's interesting because while the world exists with these large spectrums, if you go into these communities where Asians live, they have their own stuff. You go where uh, Latinos live, they have their own stuff. You go where the Arabs live, they have their own things. Now, there are always those who are integrating into the white system, but they're integrating into their own be, uh, advantages and openings. Asians can do so because they are the highest earners in the U.S., Whites can do whatever they please because they own 84% of the wealth. Now, that wealth gap is closing when it comes to Asians, but it's widening when it comes to blacks, although we've been here um, arguably the longest. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, what's the nexus? What is uh, the causality and it comes back to this need to be accepted, this need to be belonged. If you look at what can be considered the failure of the civil rights movement, it was the push to be accepted. And the moment that uh, Dr. King discovered that that wasn't the answer, that the answer was economic stability, economic empowerment, and a demand from the black uh, population uh, for reparations, he was killed. Uh, it's in the discovery of these things that we have to start developing strategies. And that's been my goal. And so then I started to come up with programs to deal with that. And then I looked and I said, OK, there's this push and this term they keep using black on black crime. And it is a subtle but very pernicious intrusion upon the black psyche and the overall social idea of what black is because it makes the suggestion that black boys killing black boys is some sort of social phenomenon when the truth of the matter is that if you visit any racial enclave, any racial community, where the vast majority of the people in the community are all the same, you're going to find out that the homicide rate is going to reflect that the same people are killing one another. In other words, 84 percent of 84, 85 percent of white homicides are committed by white people, but you never hear the term white on white crime. And the reason being is they don't want the association. See, when you say black on black crime, it gives the idea that there's something wrong with black people. And there are some things that are wrong. One thing is wrong is that we have been ushered into and engineered into long-term poverty access to certain mechanisms and opportunities simply don't exist. You have to be very creative and innovative and aware to get out and move beyond a social, uh, a, a certain social, socioeconomic level, and, or you must have some sort of physical or artistic gift uh, to be able to enrich yourself. Uh, the same mechanisms that are available to those who have 
uh, economic advantages aren't available to blacks. So then you put blacks in a situation where they are, by their very situation and circumstances, impoverished. And then you know by your own research and understanding of human behavior that poverty produces crime and crime produces violence and then you isolate that violence and you call it black on black crime as if it's some sort of social phenomenon when the truth of the matter is it is simply um, what happens in any social environment what is never hardly searched out is the almost insequential uh, impetus through which white people will kill other white people. thirst for greed the just simply growing weary you when you've done as much as I've done in the way of study and you see some of the things because you know I'm not willing to sit here and say okay black people just horrible black people are just terrible black people are just naturally violent the truth of the matter we are not uh, but when anyone is put into survival mode you change what they're capable of doing or willing to do uh, to survive and anyone who has done research and understands that that's that's why it's so important to support uh, things like our think tank because they have 1300 plus think tanks that address every issue every situation every circumstance that ensures they maintain their advantage, their privilege, their power, while keeping us at bay. And we're sitting up with the Harvest Institute and the Odyssey Project primarily as think tanks. And, and you know, there are a number of brilliant minds out there, a number of voices on platforms out there that are speaking truth to power and that are challenging us. But that is far too few when you look at the force and the power and the economic uh, catalysts and in, 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 in force behind these schemes and uh, strategies set up to work against us. We are at a disadvantage. I have, again, been looking at this thing for years. And, you know, what I share with you guys on social media isn't for likes. I told you this when I started uh, nearly 15 years ago, that it's not about likes for me. It's not about somebody patting me on the back. I don't need my ego stroked. I know who I am. I spent my whole life investing and building uh, the foundation on which I stand as me. So I don't need anybody to tell me who I am. I don't need anybody to big up me or whatever. It's not that I don't appreciate when people acknowledge me, I do. It's not that I don't appreciate when people say thank you, I do. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is I don't post based on how many likes I think I get because I definitely wouldn't be doing things the way I'm doing. I don't post based on how many subscribers I think I get because things would be different. I post because I'm leaving something and I want it to reflect who I am. I want it to reflect just how resolved I am to stay the course despite not getting the support that we need, not getting the attention that we need, not getting um, the movement and the, the, the momentum necessary. But I'm going to stay the course. I'm not going to compromise my integrity, my stance, my belief for more likes. I'm not going to do it for more donations. I'm going to be as pure in my purpose as I possibly can. I'm not perfect. I, I make mistakes. I'm human, but I'm not going to sit up and knowingly switch to be liked, switch to get support. 
I'm going to do what I think is best for my people, and that's tell the truth. That's invest myself in knowing as much as I possibly can so that I can share it with others for the purpose of growth and empowerment. Not to be liked, not somebody to say, look how smart he is. I don't need any of that. What I do need is my people to get an idea of what they're up against, for my people to understand what they're facing and where it's coming from, why certain things move a certain way, why they seem to be in the situation they're in incessantly, what can be done to change it, and how we need to move. We have to have agendas. We have to have strategies. We're going to have to change our mindset and how we deal with each other because everything around us is flowing and we're stagnant because we won't connect. We won't get moving. It's easier for us to play this individualized ideology through and through and around and around in our heads and then act on it and then think we're getting somewhere when the whole purpose of all of the stuff that has been pushed upon us by way of media influence and subliminal suggestions is to create the individualized Negro so that we stop standing together because they told you 50 plus years ago that the greatest threat to national security in America isn't the, U isn't the Soviet Union at the time, which is now Russia predominantly. It isn't China, which was an up and coming power at the time, uh, world power at the time. It isn't Cuba, who at the time had missiles pointed at the U.S. It wasn't any of those. It wasn't the Middle East where everybody hates us. It was black unity. When J. Edgar Hoover was asked, what's the greatest threat to national security? It is black unity, he said. And to double down and back up and bolster his claim, he if you look at where the energy and the resources of the FBI were being placed at that time, it was in COINTEL Pro, which was an intelligence on, 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 on a domestic intelligence program designed to infiltrate black extremist groups or black political parties like the um, Black Nationalist Party, the Black Panther Party, and on. And they did that with great effectiveness. We lost some great leaders because of it. We lost um, Chairman Fred Hampton because of it. And many times convincing our own to be the path into uh, our inner circles to destroy the brilliant minds and the leaders within it so that the movement would die. When I, in 1999, uh, discovered that the U.S. government had been found capable culpable and responsible for the death of Martin Luther King. This is actually a civil lawsuit brought by the King family against the U.S. government, and they won. It goes to show you just how far the FBI was willing to go to kill black unity. So when we talk about the importance of coming together and supporting one another, it's because that's what they fear. And the things they fear should tell you what you should be working for. They don't fear it because it has no power. They don't fear it because it has no promise. They don't fear it because there's nothing that could come out of it for black people. They fear it because that's the cat walk, so to speak, into black empowerment, black unity, us standing together, us moving together, us building together us educating our children in, in a unified, universal manner, us properly socializing our children, us properly educating and preparing and empowering our youth to become adults that go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards us and, and towards them and not only compete but win. We have a responsibility as blacks to rise up and actually move into a place of active engagement in confronting the enigmatic issues that plague our community and have done so for decades. 
This isn't where we complain. This isn't where we sit up and point fingers. This isn't where we sit up and talk about what's wrong with that person and what's wrong with this person. This is where we find our common ground. This is where we look and say, that person's better at this than me. Let me get behind them on that. And then hopefully somebody will get behind me on what I'm good. But we got to find a way to get past this individualized mindset. And then we've got to also learn to simply stop seeing the content of that people really invest their heart, their minds, their souls into developing by way of understanding and knowledge and accumulation as well as dissemination. We've got to stop treating it solely as a, 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 a source of consumption. And while we need to consume what we are be, what's being shared with us, we need to apply what we are receiving and consuming to our lives. We need to share it with others. We need to give it to one another. We need to be accountable to the cause. And that's a problem. It's amazing how white people can be at odds on so many different things, but know how to get on code when it comes to race. They'll tell you they got you. They'll tell you we're not racist. They're racist. They'll run all that stuff. But when you look at it at the end of the day, they're on code. Just look at that uh, Daniel Penny and the killing of Jordan Neely in the subway and well, he's up to $3 million raised now. He's a hero. Well, he's not really a hero. Anybody who has common sense knows he choked that man out unnecessarily. Uh, well, he choked him to death unnecessarily. And he, anybody who's had military training, hand-to-hand -hand comeback training, and taught how to do that whole chokehold understands that within 30 to 35 seconds, it will render a person unconscious. After a person becomes unconscious, they're no longer a threat. So how do we explain the other 15 minutes? See, um, I don't care who you are. You know that's wrong. But the thing is, we have to protect the narrative. Whether it's done consciously or whether it's done subconsciously. The idea that a white man could be punished for choking out a black homeless man doesn't sit well with them. On a, on a sociological, psychological level. And they naturally, instinctively respond. It's coded. It's programmed. We're programmed to do the opposite. We'll go, oh, wow. We'll write something on a sign. We'll show up and protest. Protest without economic power and economic sanction is nothing more than a collective temper tantrum. And they know this. That's why they're not concerned with it. That's why they'll let us just go ham. And they know eventually that the emotion of anger and rage will subside and we will literally go back to the way things were. Because we don't have a collective strategy, an agenda, a plan, a set of protocols that govern how we should be carrying ourselves. And what does it lead to? It leads to the dysfunction of our responses to the in, uh encroachments upon our civil liberties, our human rights, uh, our, our rights of citizenry here in this country. And it's, 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 it's imperative that we shift, that we change, that we move different, that we come to a conclusion. Um, it's time out for casual engagement on massive and uh, intensive issues with long-term ill effects. We keep passing down the same stuff to the next generation and saying this time we're gonna get it when nothing has been done differently. You keep doing the same thing, you keep getting the same results. That's the reality of it. I'm going to challenge the people who watch this video to shift in your thinking. Get outside of your comfort zone. 
and look at where we are and ask yourself, what could you do? Many of you have gifts that you can lend to this cause. Others may be able to join forces with some. Others are going to take on the role of financial supporters because it takes resources to wage this war. We're outfunded, we're outmanned. At some point, we've got to start trying to do what we can do as a people to level this playing field. It's not going to happen overnight. And the thing is, sitting up and getting frustrated with the fact that we've got a long haul and then sitting down and just resting on it doesn't improve anything. It actually expedites our demise. We have a responsibility to our progeny to rise up and be the best we can be and to pass them something to fight with in way of knowledge, in way of education, in way of strategy and plan, in way of agendas and protocols. There should be an understanding of what's next. We have to move from re reacting to responding, preparing and projecting. It's easy to sit up and dismiss, and it's a shame that we do that. It's a, it's a shame that we do that. We've got work to do. We've got work to do. So again, I'm going to challenge you to support the work we do at the Odyssey Project. The research center, the think tanks, the programs, uh, the wraparound services. There's work to be done on a national level. There are so many gaps, so many holes, so many cracks. And it's up to us to sure that up. So again, here I am challenging you. Come out of that comfort zone snap out of that slumber and realize that we're at war. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Uh, if you look in the description box, you will see a number of different ways that you can support the work we do. You can also see a link that will take you to the site where you can explore what we've done and what we've created. You can see uh, some of the in-depth uh, presentations that I've put together to give us an idea of where we're at and where we need to be. Uh, I'm always opening. I'm always open to connect with other great minds to put together some sort of plan and strategy that we can present collectively. We've got to get out of this individual mind, individualized mindset, because what they've done with the push of individualism in the black community is take the people who are capable of resourcing change in the black community and made them satisfied with the fact that they've made it. And so that's the separation between them and the those that they are literally designed and created and empowered to help. And it shows up. The strategies are working. We've got to break free of what we are allowing them to influence in our community and take action. I am going to get off of here now again for those who will help. I appreciate it. Um, again, the links are in the description box. And I thank you for your time. I'm out. You guys have a great remainder of your weekend. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special 
announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Thank you.